When you open an AOPS textbook, and I'm referring to any of the textbooks that cover middle school and high school subjects, so anything beyond Beast Academy, you're going to see something like this. This might come as a surprise if you're accustomed to math textbooks looking more like this, with lots of color, some non sequitur photographs, and even cartoons. After Beast Academy, you're not going to find cartoons or illustrations in the textbooks. Let's take a look at what Richard has to say about how to use these books. At the front of the book, he tells us that the best way to learn math is by solving problems. And indeed, you will find a lot of problems in the textbook, but maybe not in the way you are accustomed to seeing. This section is pretty typical. We have a brief introduction, and then immediately we start in with our problems. The way the problems are laid out seems to imply that you should attempt problem 10.6, problem 10.7, 10.8, and so on, and then turn to the next page and look at the solutions to those problems. I don't follow this path with my students. What we do is we begin with problem 10.6. We read through the problem, and if we immediately can't figure out the solution to the problem, we turn the page and refer to the solution here. Then we turn the page back and return to problem 10.7, make an attempt at a solution, turn the page, and then look at the solution to problem 10.7, and so on. You kind of need to go back and forth between the solutions and the problems. If we just go on to the next line here, we'll notice that it lacks the scaffolding that's provided where the problem is first presented, with parts A, B, and C stepping you through the solution. I find that this layout is a bit awkward, going back and forth between the problem and the solution. At the end of each section, there is a small collection of practice exercises. These are the exercises that students will see after learning how to factor quadratics. First notice that in total, there aren't very many practice problems. If we turn our attention to the first one, in these six quadratic equations, we see a variety of variables. The quadratic shown in part A is written in standard form with all three terms to the left of the equal sign with descending powers of the variables. But already in part B, we have the constant is on the opposite side of the equal sign. Here we have the quadratic term on the left-hand side and all the other terms are on the right. In part D, there's no linear term. Part E has some large numbers. The squared term is in the middle, preceded by the linear term. And finally, in the sixth example, we have decimals. So students are quickly expected to learn to recognize quadratics in a non-standard form. Escalating the difficulty, students are expected to find the sum of the roots and the product of the roots, presumably because they're familiar with Vieta's equations, and are able to pull them out directly from the quadratic equation without solving for the solution. In the third problem, students are expected to derive the difference of squares factorization. The next problem gives you the sum of the roots and the product of the roots and you have to work your way backwards to generate the quadratic. And then you have to solve that quadratic. The last problem is technically not a quadratic equation at all, but the product of two quadratic equations on both sides of the equation. I'm guessing you need to expand these, combine like terms, and perhaps regenerate another quadratic. This one is deemed so challenging that they've actually provided some hints. We'll discuss in a bit how to access those hints. I'd like to contrast this with a more typical practice worksheet for quadratic equations. Notice that each of these quadratic equations is in the variable x. These aren't even equations at all, so once you factor them, you're not asked to take the next logical step and solve the equation. But in any case, all of these problems have a leading coefficient of 1. The variables are lined up in descending powers of their variables. In comparison, AOPS has fewer practice problems but quickly escalates the challenge, forcing students to really understand what's going on. As a consequence, the authors at AOPS put in a lot of thought and effort into generating well-written, detailed solutions. What you won't find in AOPS is simply the answer without any explanation. Here we have solutions written to the student in detail. If you take a look at part F here, they actually illustrate an approach that they don't recommend, and then they write so instead followed by a better solution. So it's easy to quickly scan and grade your paper and check for anything that's incorrect, and then you can read in detail how to solve the problem. I like how AOPS uses up-to-date pedagogy, ensuring that students really have the big picture. Here is a standard linear equation, but AOPS really tries to push the student so that they understand that linear equations are not just in X and Y, but can have other variables, they also don't need to have just two variables. 
Here's an example of four. We can press our students to understand because the coefficient of y here is one half, it's still a linear equation. I also really like these negative examples. I have my students study these examples and be able to explain why they are not linear equations. This is time well spent because the techniques that you use to solve linear equations will not help you with nonlinear equations. The end of each chapter has a lot more practice problems. They are divided into review and challenge problems. Notice these review problems are sourced from math contest problems. We have the AMC, the Armel, HMMT. This is the Harvard MIT math tournament. This is one of the reasons AOPS is so popular with students who enjoy math contests because contest problem solving is baked right into the curriculum. Here are some challenge problems with hints attached to them. This one says hints colon 14. What you do then is you go back to the back of your textbook. At the back of the book, you'll find the hints to selected problems. And you look down here at number 14, and this will be a hint to get you started on the problem. They're numbered out of order, I suppose, so that you won't peek ahead to the next hint before you've had a, ch a chance to solve the problem on your own. My last bit of advice is if you ever have the opportunity to meet Richard in person, bring a copy of your textbook with you, have him sign it. If you have any questions about art of problem solving or math contest problems, please leave them in the comments.